The post-Cold War America, the Clinton years, 1992 to 2001. So in class, we talked about the post-Cold War America, the Bush years. So today we need to transition from George Bush to Bill Clinton. Now, if you were to go back to, say, January 1992, the fact that we would be talking about Bill Clinton as president probably would have shocked most people. He was already by then, you know, the 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 likely Democratic candidate, um, but nobody thought he had a real chance of winning in early 92 um, because George Bush, you know, maybe not quite Reagan era popularity, but he was seen as a fairly successful president. Um, in 1991, he successfully conducted the Rocky War, the Gulf War, kicking Iraq out of Kuwait, um, a war that seemed on all levels to be have done correctly. We had all the allies on our side. It was well-funded. We did not have mission creep. We accomplished our goal. We were in, we were out. And as a result of that, I mean, George Bush's approval rating were about, for a brief moment were the highest ever, nearly 90% in spring and summer of 1991. But as we'll see in a few moments, there were some problems on the horizon and economic, uh, uh, not a very strong economic uh, period, uh, 9091 being kind of the worst of that, but still 92, not completely recovering. And one particular promise that seemed to be broken. But let's talk about his competition before we talk about the election. His main competitor, of course, uh, was the Democratic candidate, Bill Clinton, somebody I'm sure everyone in the class is familiar with. Although, as of 2022, um, you guys may very well be more familiar with his spouse, Hillary Clinton, uh, because she's really been the big player in the 2000s. So real quick, uh, just a little bit of background on Bill Clinton and a little bit on his spouse, Hillary. Um, he's from Arkansas originally, comes from very poor beginnings, actually grew up in a trailer. He came from a single parent household. Uh, but he was incredibly smart. Um, and, and as far as street smarts and book smarts, he really was up there. I mean, he did test literally at the genius level. Although, as you'll see as president, he didn't always make the smartest decisions in his private life. Um, but, you know, he does become, he goes to Georgetown, he becomes a Rhodes Scholar, actually spends some time in Oxford. And again, almost everybody who knew him by the time he was a teenager saw that this guy was on his way to accomplishing something, probably something to do with politics. Um, and so, you know, when he was in college, you know, he was already involved in politics. He actually ran for student government at Georgetown. But one of the big moves he made was marrying um, a fellow student, uh, Hillary Rodham. She was really in some ways the person that gave him um, an anchor and really kind of guided his ambition, if you will. What's interesting is that at the time, a lot of people kind of assumed she would be the most successful one. I think for a while, people kind of saw Hillary as somebody who were riding his coattails. But in many ways, she was, at least early on, kind of the more accomplished one of the two. She just didn't quite have that star quality, that, that overwhelming charm that Bill Clinton had. Um, she actually began her her. Um, sort of young years as a Republican, but by 1968, she had switched uh, to the Democratic Party. She was very involved in a lot of issues in Washington as a grad student. In fact, she was on the Watergate Investigative Committee, um, helping to uh, set up the case against Richard Nixon. Again, she was kind of a, a, a legal star at that point. But in 1975, uh, she and Bill Clinton marry. Uh, he had been asking her for years to marry him, but she finally agreed in 1975. Um, and to a large degree, which was very typical of a lot of women at this time, even though this is the beginning of the second wave of the women's movement, sort of, you know, kind of sacrificed a little bit of her career because he clearly had, by that point, uh, he was the youngest attorney general ever of Arkansas, and he was about to be the youngest ever governor of Arkansas. Uh, she saw he had the career, so she kind of backs off a little bit and uh, sort of paves the way for him. So he runs and wins for governor of Arkansas. Uh, at that point, they only had two year terms. He was seen as a bit too liberal, a bit too left wing. Uh, a lot of people did not like his Chicago born, his Illinois born wife. 
saw saw her as a little too liberal, a little too feminist, and was promptly voted out of office in 1981. Um, it stung. He realized how much he wanted to maintain this job, and so he began to move to the center. Um, Hillary Clinton was sort of convinced to kind of back off a little bit more, maybe change her hairstyle, look a little less Chicago, um, and became, you know, kind of seen as the dutiful wife. And it worked. Uh, he wins re-election several times uh, to the governorship of Arkansas. By 1988, an election we've talked quite a bit about, he was seen as, again, the rising star um, in the Democratic Party. He was young. He was good looking. He was charming. He was from the South. So you bring the South which by that point was much more conservative, much more Republican, kind of like Jimmy Carter in 76. You get Bill Clinton in there. I mean, I it, political scientists still tell you, if you can get somebody from the South who's a good candidate, you have a very good chance of winning elections. Because again, um, especially if you're, well, I was gonna say, especially if you're a Democrat, it helps Democrats if you're Southern, but really it doesn't matter which party. Having the South, bringing the South to the table is, is a big thing. And Bill Clinton was seen as, he's the guy that's going to do that. In fact, in 87, he almost threw his hat into the ring for the 88 election, uh, but he kind of saw how much competition there was. He knew he was still young. He said, I'm going to wait, wait at least till 92. But he was given a prime spot in the 1988 Democratic National Convention, the spot to introduce the presidential candidate. Uh, of course, in 1988, that was going to be Michael Dukakis. Uh, just to give you a sense of this, I mean, we do see many future candidates fulfill that role. Most famously, uh, in 2004, it was Barack Senator Barack Obama who introduced John Kerry at the 2004 Democratic National Convention. Everybody was blown away by, by Obama's speech, and people already were saying, that's the guy who's going to run for president. And of course, in 2008, he won. He, he runs and wins the presidency. So this was going to be, uh, you know, basically 20 years earlier, but this was supposed to be Bill Clinton's moment. And it is a disaster. Uh, Bill Clinton, and I can identify with this because I know I tend to do this too. He likes to talk and he always talks way too long. He's too detailed and he starts to get booed. I'm going to play a little bit of this. No, I'm not. This is a wrong clip. This is the clip I want to play. You. Swelling the ranks of the truly disadvantaged. We accept far more adult illiteracy than others do. By this point, you can already hear the audience. You know, they're talking. You know, you can hear this just a, of the crowd that they're not paying attention at all. Even though we know that 80% of the workforce in the year 2000 is already working, and we know that when workers can't read, eventually they'll have to pay for it, and we will too. We tolerate more homeless children than others do degrading the most blameless among us. We live in the only advanced country in the world that's still in the dark ages when it comes to child care. That means we have lower productivity on the job and higher stress in the home. Our school dropout rates are twice competing with ours. For they're the good bored, job. they're not like paying attention, they're, they're turning the attention. other way. And he should have been done about five minutes ago because it was scheduled to go only 20. We say all this, we're going to be here. We'll have to be here until this whole proceeding is over. But at the same time, they, they have to be aware of the uh, television audience and whether or not it is staying with this lengthy speech, which is a recitation of a lot of the stuff that we've heard in the past couple of days. As these delegates continue to interrupt the speech from time to time with some demonstrations. Chris, where are you? I'm uh, in the New Jersey delegation, and I can tell you that this uh, place is just ready to explode, and I think that they're long past the period, Tom, of listening to Governor Bill Clinton. This is so again, they're all like, Dukakis, Dukakis, we can't wait. It's ironic that, that Dukakis was going to lose and Bill Clinton would go on to win. Uh, but at this point, people are like, who is this guy? Oh, my gosh. Um, but Clinton, I mean, he was incredibly embarrassed by this, saw his political career was over. But he very smartly decided to use that moment, and he very quickly turned around, went on Johnny Carson, The Tonight Show, and essentially made fun of himself. Arkansas.
Well, Governor, <laughs> I thank you for coming here tonight, and my first question is, how are you? And actually, apparently that was Bill Clinton's idea for him to pull out a timepiece so he won't go too long. So he shows he has a sense of humor. He, he, you know, he leans into his mistakes, you know, and it worked. People kind of, I mean, he still became notorious for being the guy who got booed and yelled at, uh, went too long. But the fact that he has a sense of humor, because he is thinking 92. I mean, this is, again, this is 88. He's thinking 92. Remember, um, when you're in politics, you got to play the long game. And I'm going to come back to Bill Clinton uh, in a moment, but let me go ahead and play a clip that I really should have had a little bit later, but since it's here. Uh, in the 1992 election, once he is the real candidate, he's going to continue to use uh, shows like, you know, The Tonight Show um, and other shows. At that point, there was a show called Arsenio Hall, which was sort of a competitor to The Tonight Show. And Bill Clinton, you know, he was the baby, the first of the real baby boomer uh, candidates. He's our first baby boomer president. But, you know, so he's grown up in the 50s, and 60s. He's a rock and roll president, big fan of Elvis, big fan of the Beatles and Rolling Stones. He played the saxophone. So he very famously played the saxophone on Arsenio Hall, another late night show. <laughs> And again, you can't imagine George H.W. Bush or Ronald Reagan doing something like this. He would go on MTV, basically saying, you can ask me anything. People asked him. It was he infamously, I think it was on MTV, was asked, does he wear boxers or briefs? Apparently, the answer was boxers. Uh, he was there's always been rumors of him smoking marijuana. And he said that he never inhaled, that he couldn't inhale. And everybody s laughed at him. Um, although my own father always said. Well, I, I've never been able to inhale either. You know, a lot of people literally can't inhale. Uh, and so many people who knew him said, no, he's actually telling the truth. He never did inhale, but he did ingest. <laughs> Apparently he liked pop brownies. But anyway, um, so he was seen as kind of this young, hip uh, candidate in a way that the other candidates at that point were. Uh, definitely a, a real counterpoint uh, to uh, George H.W. Bush. But it was still going to be a close race. And in fact, in early 92, when some of this is happening, the assumption is George H.W. Bush probably is still going to be uh, the winner of this election. But 92 was an interesting year because it's one of the first years that we have a viable third party candidate. So again, in our elections, going all the way back to the beginning of the country, we've always had essentially two main parties. Democrat, Republicans, and Federalists at the beginning, later Democrats and Whigs, and then, of course, Republicans and Democrats. Every so often, there'll be a third party, the Populist Party or the Progressive Party. Usually, they stick around for a brief period, and then they go away, or they get subsumed into one of the two main parties. Um, and again, I mean, every election, you might have as many as 30 candidates, but generally speaking, there's two main candidates. But every so often, you will see a third person pop up. And in 1992, we see a third person who clearly had uh, a real impact on this election. In fact, uh, many people, and I'm, I'm included in this, believe that it had not been for Ross Perot, we probably would have seen uh, George Bush in a squeaker of an election, but we probably would have seen George H.W. Bush actually get reelected. So real quick, uh, many of you may not know Ross Perot anymore because uh I mean, he passed away a few years ago, but he really hadn't been in the public eye since the 1990s. He ran in 92. He would also run again in 96, although that year it wasn't as significant and pretty much disappears from the public eye after that. Uh, but Ross Perot was from Texas, just like George Bush. In fact, he essentially did not like George Bush, which was his motivation to run in 92. Uh, but he uh, served in the military, in the army in the 50s. Uh, for a couple of years, but he quickly got involved in the growing computer business. You know, I mean, we really see the first computers in the late 40s, um, and he gets involved in electronic data services. In fact, his company was EDS, and he um, gets some major contracts with the federal government. Uh, he's, I think it's in 68, he's considered the, 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 the fastest rising rich man in Texas. In other words, this guy's barely in the 30s, and he's already a multimillionaire. Um, 
and it just continues to rise up uh, in, in, in influence and wealth. He becomes a billionaire before it's over with. Um, he very famously kind of became nationally known because right before the Iranian revolution and right before the American hostages were taken, some revolutionaries actually took some of his employees, held them hostage, and he actually organized a private sort of uh, military group to go in and get them out. And so during the Carter years of the hostage crisis, he would very openly criticize Carter. You know, why can't you do it? I, I rescued the people. Why can't the federal government do it? Uh, and throughout the 80s, became much, much more outspoken. He uh, would and later, by the way, invest in Apple and help Steve Jobs and some of his stuff. But he, by 1992, was known as a plain speaking, uh, get to the point, successful Southern billionaire. And in other words, he was to Donald Trump. I'm talking about politics now. He was to Donald Trump before Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump was already around, by the way, as a multimillionaire and very well known, but just not involved in politics yet. But he was, before there was a Donald Trump, he was the billionaire who got involved in politics and kind of had that idea of, I'm going to speak plainly. I'm an outsider. I don't talk like these politicians. I'm going to give you simple solutions. I'm going to be funny. I'm going to charm my way in. Um, the big difference, there was a difference between him and Donald Trump. Donald Trump never quite gave, love or hate the guy, he never really gave solutions. He would just, you know, say, oh, I'm going to have the best, we're going to be the best presidency ever. You just wait and see, we're going to be better than ever. Ross Perot would actually get very specific. Um, whether his plans would have worked, we can debate about that. But he would actually say exactly, so he was, he was much more detail-oriented than Donald Trump was. Okay, I'll get off Donald Trump. I just, there are a lot of parallels here. Um, so I'm gonna play a little bit of, there was one major debate that all three of them were at. I mean, again, it's weird to see a debate where it's not just two people. I'm gonna play a couple of clips in the next few minutes from this debate, but I wanna play this one so you can get a little flavor of Ross Perot's voice and kind of how he uh, explained things. So here we are. The candidates will have an opportunity to make a closing statement. So, President Bush, I think you said it earlier, let's get it on. Let's go. <laughs> and I think the first question is over here. Yes, I'd like to direct my question to Mr. Perot. Uh, what will you do as president to open foreign markets to fair competition from American business and to stop unfair competition here at home from foreign countries so that we can bring jobs back to the United States? That's right at the top of my agenda. We've shipped millions of jobs overseas and uh, we have a strange situation because we have a process in Washington where after you've served for a while you cash in, become a foreign lobbyist, make $30,000 a month, then take a leave, work on presidential campaigns, make sure you've got good contacts and then go back out. Now, if you just want to get out of brass tacks, first thing you ought to do is get all these folks who've got these one-way trade agreements that we've negotiated over the years and say, fellas, we'll take the same deal we gave you. And they'll gridlock right at that point. Because, for example, we've got international competitors who simply could not unload their cars off the ships if they had to comply. You see, if it was a two-way street, just couldn't do it. We have got to stop sending jobs overseas. To those of you in the audience who are business people, pretty simple. If you're paying $12, $13, $14 an hour for factory workers, and you can move your factory south of the border, pay a dollar an hour for labor, hire a young 25, that's assume you've been in business for a long time, you've got a mature workforce. Pay a dollar an hour for your labor, have no health care, that's the most expensive single element, making a car, have no environmental controls, no pollution controls, and no retirement, and you don't care about anything but making money, there will be a giant sucking sound going south. So we, if, if the people send me to Washington, the first thing I'll do is study that 2,000-page agreement and make sure it's a two-way street. The candidates will have... So sorry, I know it's a little bit long of a clip, but I, I, that's when he talks about that loud sucking sound, that was a very famous quote at the time. But you can hear, you can already hear that kind of plain speaking. He seems to get really detailed. Hey, I've been in business a long time. I know how this works. These politicians don't. I get this stuff done. Again, I, I said I wouldn't say it, but I will say it one more time. He does sound a little bit like Trump in that, you know, let's get to the point. You know, I've, I'm in business. I know what to do. But he does get a little more detailed. He, you know, once he gets a little further in, 
some people are going to debate whether he was very detailed. Let me play a little bit of one of his ads, which is basically just him talking in, in, in this debate setting. Pretty simply, who's the best qualified person up here on the stage to create jobs? Make your decision and vote on November the 3rd. I suggest you might consider somebody who's created jobs. Second, who's the best person to manage money? I suggest you pick a person who's successfully managed money. Who's the best person to get results and not talk? Look at the record, make your decision. And finally, who would you give your pension fund and your savings account to, to manage? And last one, who would you ask to be the trustee of your estate and take care of your children if something happened to you? Finally, to your students up there, God bless you, I'm doing this for you. I want you to have the American dream. I mean, you can hear the audience kind of with them. I mean, you're, like, you're kind of laughing with them. Oh, they keep saying, last thing, last thing. He says three more things. And of course, you know, the voice is it's fun to do. I got laryngitis right now, so I can't really do it. But uh, I'm Ross Perot. I can't, you know, he's he was just a character. And he did seem to be plain spoken. You can, uh, you can probably still see the appeal of him even today. And of course, uh, shows like Saturday Night Live love to do Ross Perot. Dana Carvey, who was already doing George Bush every week, started also doing... Uh, Ross Perot, this little taste of Dana Carvey doing Ross Perot and starting out live. I'm a little baby love shortening, shortening. Mama's little baby love shortening bread. Put on the skillet, put on the lid. Mama's gonna make a little shortening bread. All right, now. So again, he was a character. He was easy to make fun of. But at the same time, he there was a lot of real appeal. In fact, in the summer of 92, by the way, he was running as an independent. Um, there was some thought that this guy might not only be on the ballot, which he was, he might actually win. Um, now, at the same time, uh, real quick to give you a little background of as far as what happened, um, he, in August of 1992, Bill Clinton was nominated for the Democratic Party. He was polling very high by that point. In fact, by August of 1992, it was beginning to look like this is gonna be Clinton's election, close, but probably Clinton's election. He decides to back out of the election at that point. Some people said it's because he knew he wasn't going to beat Bill Clinton at that point. Others said, well, he just wanted George Bush to get out of office. And whether it was him or Bill Clinton, he was going to be happy. So he leaves. And it made a lot of people very angry because he had a huge amount of support at this point. He had millions of volunteers working, literally people going out, getting them on the ballot. And so he later will come back in October of 92. He re-enters the race. And he claimed at that point that the reason he left was because his daughter was getting married and he had heard that the Republicans had some weird plan to sabotage the wedding. Uh, he does come back in October. There's no evidence that that was going to happen. Um, I think it was supposed to be some gossip they were going to release about his daughter. He comes back. He's still popular. I mean, that's when he actually did the debates, but he never quite recaptured that magic, if you will. There, there, you know, and I can say my own father, who kind of liked Ross Perot, he kind of went, I think he's a little nuts now. And so there was a fear like, what if he becomes president and just walks away, you know? So again, there's always been the what if question of politics. What if he hadn't quit in August? Would he have won? Um, my answer is probably no, but I think he, it would have been a very close election. But again, all the way up, at least until the summer of 92, you know, again, you kind of thought, well, it's going to be this guy's election. But by late 92, Bill Clinton's getting the nomination. He's polling very high. Ross Perot's not doing too bad, at least until he quit. So again, why is that when this guy had nearly 90% approval ratings? But if you start looking throughout 92, especially by summer of 92, he was down to 29%. And a little over a year, he goes down 50 points in approval ratings. It's one of the biggest dips of all time. And this is because, because partly because of the Ross Perot factor, the Bill Clinton factor, but a lot of this has to do simply with the economy and including the fact that George Bush had promised in 1988 not to raise taxes. We talked about this in class. Um, he, he always said, I shouldn't have made that promise. And he did actually have to raise taxes in 1990 because there was a deficit in the federal budget and the economy was bad. And it was necessary to raise taxes. And so, of course, Bill Clinton's campaign and Ross Perot's campaign latched on to the that. George Bush promise. Read my lips. No new taxes. 
Then he gave us the second biggest tax increase in American history. So again, the- it had everything to do with the economy, whether we're talking about raising taxes or a very poor economy. Even though 92 was starting to get better, especially by, by the election, there were still real effects of the economy. Lastly, George Bush always had a bit of, of an image problem. His voice, I mean, we talked about this in 88, the wimp factor. Um, a lot of real conservatives kind of didn't trust him because he was very critical of Reagan before he became vice president. Uh, people on the left thought he was too conservative. I always personally, when I, you know, this was my first election I voted in, I, I was always big in the environment. I always thought he was terrible in the environment. He's an oil man. Although actually looking back, he wasn't that bad on the environment, it turns out. But a lot of us didn't know that in 1992. But some of it was just the way he came off. He was a Washington elite. He was from a very well-off you know, political family. And he didn't seem to relate to common people. And again, so much of politics is his image. So this is another clip from that same debate. Uh, I'm going to show two answers, one by George Bush and then one by Bill Clinton. They're both responding to the same woman. And I like to do this in class instead of doing it online. But, but just think about which one, if you didn't know anything, which one of these two would you vote for just based on this clip? We have a question right here. Yes, how has the national debt... By the way, I, did you notice what George Bush just did? This, you know, this young African-American woman, about, you haven't seen her yet, but she's just getting up to talk. I'm going to back it up a little bit. Let's see here. So watch George Bush. We have a question right here. Yes, how has the national debt... Now he's just doing something we all do. He's just checking the time. But it has that, uh, all right, get on with your question. I mean, it seems like a silly thing, but that was a big controversial moment. The fact that he checked his watch. Personally affected each of your lives. And if it hasn't, how can you honestly find a cure for the economic problems of the common people if you have no experience in what's ailing them? Well, I think the national debt affects everybody. Uh, obviously, it has has a lot to do with interest rates. It has. She's saying you, you personally. You, on a personal basis, how has it affected you? Has it affected you personally? Well, I'm sure it has. I love my grand grandchildren. I want to think how? that. I want to think think that they're going to be able to afford an education. I think that that's an important part of being a parent. I, if the question, if you're maybe I won't get it wrong, are you suggesting that if somebody has means, that the national debt doesn't affect them? Well, what I'm, saying I'm, I'm not sure I get it. Help me with the question and I'll well, try to answer it. I've had friends that have been laid off from jobs. Yeah. I know people who cannot afford to pay the mortgage on their homes, their car payment. I have personal yeah. uh, problems with the national debt. But how has it affected you? And if you have no experience in it, how can you help us if you don't know what we're feeling? I think she means more the recession, um, the economic problems today the country faces well, rather listen, than the you ought to you ought to be in the white house for a day and hear the, what i hear and see what i see and read the mail i read and touch the people that i touch from time to time i was in the lomax ame church it's a black church just outside of washington dc and i read in the uh, in the bulletin about teenage pregnancies about the difficulty that families are having to meet ends, make ends meet. I talk to parents. I mean, you got to care. Everybody cares if people aren't doing well. But I don't think it. I don't think it's fair to say you haven't had cancer, therefore you don't know what it's like. And I, I'm going to play Clinton's in just a second, but I wanted to because it's a longer clip. I want to go ahead and talk about it for two seconds. Um, so you know, you can see part of this is even his voice he sounds aggravated and, and he kind of is she's she's kind of keeps interrupting them i mean it's you know it's i was always surprised me a little bit that you know she's like how how and he's like uh what what do you mean he, he's not quite looking at her and, and and but he's also trying to he keeps addressing the crowd like he sees her then he addresses the crowd right um and then he you know and, and i've played this many times in class and i've heard several students laugh because he starts going like because she's black so he immediately says, well, I was at a black church one time and there was some teenage pregnant, you know, and it's almost like, oh, no, it's almost like saying, I'm not racist. I have black friends. He, I don't think he meant it that way, but it it it, it came off very. Um, what's the what's the word I want to look for? It, 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 
it, it came off very insensitive. That's not quite the word I want there, but but you know, it, but but it felt like oh, he he just kind of leaned into exemplify the out of touchness that she was accusing him of having. So let me let me fast forward to Bill Clinton answering the question just for time. Okay. So say so so now Bill Clinton's going to answer the same question. Thank Governor you. Clinton. Glad to clarify. Tell me how it's affected you again. Um. You know people who lost their well, jobs, yeah. lost their homes. Uh -huh. Well, I've been governor of a small state for 12 years. I'll tell you how it's affected me. Every year, Congress and the president sign laws that makes us, make us do more things. It gives us less money to do it with. I see people in my state, middle class people, their taxes have gone up in Washington and their services have gone down. While the wealthy have gotten tax cuts. I have seen what's happened in this last four years when, in my state, when people lose their jobs, there's a good chance I'll know them by their names. When a factory closes, I know the people who ran it. When the businesses go bankrupt, I know them. And I've been out here for 13 months, meeting in meetings just like this, ever since October, with people like you all over America. People that have lost their jobs, lost their livelihood, lost their health insurance. And, you know, and I know I cut Bush off, but he basically was saying the same thing. You should sit in the White House and see what I've seen. I've seen people hurt. But he seemed aggravated. He didn't look at her. He, 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 you know, some people even, I, I don't necessarily agree with this, but some people even interpreted like he wasn't comfortable that she was black and he seemed like not quite how to talk to her. He walks right up to her. He's looking her right in the eye. Tell me how you feel. You know, I mean, you know, and he's not looking at anybody else. He's looking right at her. He seems caring. But if you actually listen, he's saying the same thing. But it's the way he says it. It's the demeanor when she said he seems to care. He feels her pain, as he very famously would say many times. And again, it is amazing how much image matters and, and body language matters in politics. And, and we know it matters in real life, too. You know, it matters with how professors deal with students sometimes. So uh, in many ways, to me, this is the key moment. Um, and, you know, I think for a lot of people, this is when it switched from Bush to Clinton. A lot of people really remember this particular moment. And again, the economy, as you notice, that question was about the economy. And I will say the economy was much worse in 91 and 92 than many people might realize. Um, I mean, there was real thought that we might really be heading into an actual depression. It turns out we didn't, obviously. But there was real belief that, that we might be heading in that direction, especially by early 1992. Things do start to get better later in 92. As you can see here, you can see the recession, the effects. Um, by the time you get uh, to 92, it, things are starting to get better. But at the same time, um, again, the economy was what everybody was afraid of. And of course, this became the um the uh the catchphrase for the clinton campaign internally you know don't get bogged down on other issues it's the economy stupid and that basically that's a line that james carville the bald guy there that you may see on television uh he uh he was the advisor for bill clinton in the campaign he basically ran his campaign and that's what he would say to him bill it's the economy stupid don't get caught up in these other things that's what people are, are voting for um so essentially what happened with the economy um, you know, a lot of this is, is what happened in the eighties, the later nineties are going to be a great period for economics in the early two thousands. We're going to see a similar thing where we kind of pay the price for that by 2008. We see the same thing in the twenties where, where the economy is great, but at the same time, there are a lot of problems that people weren't dealing with. And we paid the price in the thirties. We kind of see this in the early nineties. We do see an oil crisis that comes out of that Iraq invasion of Kuwait, drives the oil prices up. That of course drives gas up, that drives transportation costs up, which drives food prices up, which means more uh, effect on our pocketbooks, right? Um, defense spending under Reagan, I mean, shoots up. There's massive deficits, meaning we're, we're spending more money than we actually have in the federal government. Something I'm not going to get into, but it actually directly affected George Bush, was the saving of loans crisis. This was just where bad lending was going on and people were making a lot of money off bad lending. Neil Bush, the other son of George Bush, the one that everybody forgets about, he was actually implicated in the saving and loans crisis. So again, there was an impression that George Bush uh, hands were dirty in, in the economy, if you will. Unemployment was shooting up. Uh, actually, the graph I showed you actually was about the unemployment. Um, and again, we're seeing lots of cuts 
by Reagan to things like welfare, you know, these programs that actually helped a lot of people during times, but yet the really expensive programs like Social Security, um, like defense, you know, the, the bulk of the federal budget were not touched. And so, you know, we cut the things that weren't very expensive, but actually may have helped people in economic crisis. But the really expensive stuff that was sucking up a lot of the money were still there. So it was kind of a combo of a lot of these things that were happening. And for a lot of Americans, rightly or wrongly, they saw the Republicans as the originators of this economic problem. So when you actually look at the election um, between the two main candidates, Bush and Clinton, because again, with Perot leaving, uh, Perot really had no chance of actually winning, but he still gets almost 20% of the vote, meaning one in five voters voted for Perot. Most of those voters were coming from the Republican side, which means he had a direct impact on the outcome of this election. Compared to other elections, this is not a blowout, as you can see. Uh, it's fairly evenly matched between the two parties, but Bill Clinton does indeed win. So why did Bush lose? Well, there's the Perot factor, which we've talked about. Um, this poor media image and that debate moment didn't help um, the economy, of course. But to some degree, you know, this was now 12 years of the Republican Party in charge, you know, Reagan and then Bush. And it, it did seem that people, especially younger people, and again, for Gen Xers like me, this was so, for some of us, this was our first election. There was kind of a hunger for new blood, for, for something different to go in. And Bill Clinton clearly was different. He felt different, he was young, he was a different generation than the previous presidents. And so it, it kind of was almost inevitable um, that we were gonna see a switch, especially again with that economy. So Bill Clinton becomes our 42nd president. It was a bitter election in many ways, and George H.W. Bush has been very, was very clear over the years how much it actually hurt. He was actually quite a sensitive guy, despite how he comes off sometimes. And um, this was not revealed for many years, but presidents usually write letters to the next person coming in. They're usually kept private, at least for a long time. This was actually the letter uh, that George H.W. Bush left for Bill Clinton. And it says, you know, when I walked into this office just now, I felt the same sense of wonder and respect that I felt four years ago. I know you will feel that too. I wish you great happiness here. I never felt the loneliness some presidents have described. He's really referring to Nixon there. Um, there will be very tough times, made even more difficult by criticism. You may not think it's fair. I'm not very good to give advice, uh, but just don't let the critics discourage you and push you off course, you will be our president when you read this note. I wish you well, I wish your family well. Your success now is our country's success. And again, it, it kind of reminds you that, you know, despite the, the debates and stuff, you know, they're, they're still humans and they can still be very nice to each other. Okay, let's walk away from politics. We will come back to Bill Clinton at the end here. Let's talk about some other things that happened in the 90s. The 90s was the decade of the internet, the decade of cable culture and cable news. And so we do get a lot of media spectacles, if you will, um, high profile crime cases and court cases. But a few of these, I think, actually remain important. What I said in class the other day is that the 90s were kind of a quiet decade compared to other decades. Um, and there were lots of silly things that happened that we rolled our eyes at. But some of those things turned out to be incredibly important. The internet, the World Wide Web being one of those. Another one was something that absolutely was a media spectacle, but looking back actually was quite significant in some ways. Um, and that's the OJ Simpson murder trial, um, which dominated the news for a full two years. So for, it, for many of you who may not be familiar uh, completely with who OJ Simpson was, OJ Simpson, um, from California originally, who uh, became a major college football star. He won the Heisman Trophy, went on to play pro football for the Buffalo Bills, um, seemed to be a very nice guy, uh, very telegenic. Everyone liked him. He started doing commercials in the 70s while still a pro football player. Got in, and Once he retired, he got into acting, did lots of roles on TV shows and movies. By the 1980s, late 80s, he was starring or co-starring in a series of comedy films called the Naked Gun series. Everyone liked the guy. He seemed like a decent guy. Uh, by the late 80s, he was married to a woman named Nicole Brown. That's the person in the middle with the sunglasses and blonde hair. They were kind of a big deal Hollywood couple. Um by the way, you may notice some of the other people in this image. Uh, 
uh, O.J. Simpson's good friend, was then named, I'm going to dead name somebody, I apologize in advance, but then Olympian star Bruce Jenner, today known as Caitlyn Jenner. Um, but you may also notice who these people are. Um, by that point, uh, Jenner was married to Chris, formerly Chris Kardashian, now Chris Jenner, uh, and those are the Kardashian children, including Kim Kardashian. Uh, the Kardashians are continuing to be a part of the story. In summer of 1994, I believe in June of 1994, these two people, Nicole Brown on the right, who was very good friends with then Chris Jenner and the Kardashian family, O.J. Simpson was very good friends with Robert Kardashian, the former husband of Chris Jenner. Um, O.J. and Nicole Brown had had a very ugly divorce. Um, he was not ready to let go. He would uh, apparently leave lots of angry phone messages. Uh, he beat her up one time. He would stalk her. Um, and one night he noticed that she was spending time with the guy on the right, Ron Goldman, who was a waiter. There's still debates whether they were dating or not, or they just knew each other. She was at a restaurant. She left her sunglasses behind. He went to her apartment to return them. O.J. Simpson confronted them there. And the next day they are found brutally murdered, near, both of them nearly decapitated. Um, because these are famous people, the Browns, Nicole Brown, O.J. Simpson, it suddenly becomes a big story. But nobody suspects O.J. at first until a few days after the murder, uh, O.J. literally gets his friend to drive him in a white Bronco down the highway. And because he's supposed to return to, you know, he's supposed to report to the police to be interviewed. And instead, he takes off in a Bronco, apparently with a gun, with a disguise, with his passport. The news finds out everyone's following the news. This has now become an media circus. Now he's acting like a guilty person. He eventually is charged with the crime of double murder. And we're off and running. This is the perfect mix. It's celebrity. It's Hollywood. It's sex. It's race because they were interracial couple, although that wasn't at the time initially a big deal, but it started to become a big deal during uh, the trial. Uh, it's murder. It's violence. It just has all the elements that American public loved. And now you had 24 hour cable. You had court TV. It was a perfect mix, if you will. Race does start to become part of the conversation. For instance, both Newsweek and Time magazine published the uh you know, the arrest photo of, 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 of Simpson. But as you notice, one on the left is actually the actual photo. Time magazine darkened the photo. And some people thought that was to make him look, quote, unquote, more black, therefore more menacing, more, you know. Other people say it was just a stylistic choice. It wasn't necessarily meant in any, but again, right from the start, we're starting to see a conversation about race happening. OJ does have a lot of money. You know, his friend Robert Kardashian, the guy on the right there, uh, becomes one of his lawyers. He's able to hire some of the greatest of people, some of the greatest minds like Johnny Cochran, Robert Shapiro, F. Lee Bailey, uh, several others. I mean, he has a huge team. They were known as the dream team to defend him. Uh, the most famous moment in the trial, these bloody gloves were found. Uh, one was found in his Bronco with blood drips. Uh, also, there were blood drippings around the Bronco. The other glove was found at the murder scene. These are gloves that he has been seen wearing in other photos before the murder. And so, you know, this is one of the pieces of evidence implicating him in the crime. Uh, he was very famously convinced to put the gloves on. You can kind of see him doing his hands like this. You know, they don't fit. And of course, the line became that don't fit, you must acquit. What everybody forgets about is that the next day, because um, he is wearing rubber gloves, they put them over. The next day, they actually had him do it again, and they actually fit perfectly. Uh, let me just say this. Um, the evidence is pretty overwhelming. Um, I may not have said this 30 years ago as a professor, but I, I, I think now anybody who studies this crime knows the evidence is pretty overwhelming towards O.J. Simpson. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. But he was found not guilty. Part of the defense, and it was brilliant defense, there's no getting around it, putting the gloves on was a perfect moment. Even though they did later go on and fit, no one remembers that. Um, we've talked about the LAPD, Rodney King beatings, the LA riots, uh, the Latasha Harlings murder, the fact that many African-Americans in LA and the rest of the country really did feel like the justice system wasn't on their side. And there was a lot of sense that it wasn't always on their side. And this appeared to be, uh, uh, for some people, this seemed to be another example of that. Um, the evidence doesn't bear that 
out. But I remember when in 1995, when the verdict came down, I was working at a bank. There are a lot of us. We went to Arby's of all places because they had a TV. We didn't have we didn't have smart smartphones at that point. So we literally had to go to a TV to figure out, you know, because we wanted to see it live and it was packed. And I remember, you know, the verdict came out not guilty. And a lot of us were shocked. I was shocked. I thought for sure he'd be found guilty. But I remember the reaction was partly based on race. Not completely, you know, I, I hate to lump everybody together, but I got a good friend named Kenny. He was African-American. And he had told me privately he thought OJ was guilty. But I remember I was shocked. My friend Chris, who was white, was shocked. Kenny kind of smiled. And I remember I asked him later, I said, I thought you thought he was guilty. And he's like, well, maybe. But he said, now he was only about 21 at the time. But he said, I, I'm thinking of Rodney. I'm thinking about some of those other cases. And that's not how everybody thought. But there was a sense that some people felt that there's been so much injustice the other way, you know. And not, again, not everybody felt that way, but it was interesting that people reactions to this did, that sometimes fell along racial lines. And that was interesting. And just like the Rodney King case, it reminded us Americans, there was still racial divides. We were seeing this through different eyes. So it did become a media circus. Like I said, it, 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 I think it ushered in the crime as entertainment. We've already seen politics becoming entertainment. Now crime itself is entertainment. This is just the first of many high profile crime cases that really are watched almost as a TV show. Now with smartphones and podcasts, we're all listening to true crime podcasts. We're watching movies and TV shows about Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy. You know, I can kind of trace that that impulse back to the OJ trial. It's also kind of the beginning of reality TV. This does become a reality TV show. Many of the people involved in this go on to be media. People like Marsha Clark go on to become media TV hosts and authors and best-selling authors. Of course, the Kardashians become known partly out of this. Um, but it did bring up that conversation on race. And again, what I described where some people were happy that he was found guilty, not guilty, that doesn't describe everybody. But however you felt about this case, race was interwoven in this case. And again, it was another reminder that race is still an issue, something we're, we're not shocked at anymore. But in the 90s, it was shocking for some people. And it was shocking that people did see this case differently. Some people trusted the police. Other people didn't trust the police. So therefore, they were willing to question the evidence. This is also the first case that DNA was used in a big way in a court case. We forget how recent the use of DNA is for evidence. And a lot of people didn't understand DNA. And this also seems to have played a role in the outcome of the trial was the fact that not everybody understood DNA at that time. Um, finally, what I, the real issue I think that matters here is I think the hidden issue here, uh, but it's, it's the important issue. It's not about race. It's not about DNA. It's about class and fame. What this trial really revealed is that if you have money, if you're well known, if you hire the right lawyers and you get the media on your side, you can beat a murder case. And I think that's the more important lesson here, more so than all the other stuff that everyone was talking about at the time, was the fact that there were plenty of people that would have been in this situation that would have gotten the electric chair. Unless you get the right, you know, anyway. So I think that's actually the hidden agenda here. But it was big enough that it that it does warrant a mention in a history class. And again, I think we can still see some of the impacts of these conversations today. And again, the beginning of DNA, the beginning of these trials as entertainment. Okay, also talking about crime, but a very different sort. We do begin to see terrorism in the U.S., something we hadn't really seen much of before. We saw some hijackings, but most of those happened elsewhere. But now we're starting to see actual terrorism happening within the borders of the U.S. The most, one of the earliest and most dramatic of these was a truck bombing of the World Trade Center. Uh, this was pre-9-11, and this was a, a, a bombing that was tied back to Iran and how, tied back to Al-Qaeda. Uh, the hope was actually to, to really cause more damage than it even did, but the way the building was built, it actually, the, the damage was relatively minimal. And again, pre-9-11, you could buy t-shirts saying, I survived terror at the towers. You could imagine this today, because obviously post-9-11, uh, very different story. 
But what we also begin to see, in addition to terrorism by Iran, terrorism by Al Qaeda, most of that happening elsewhere, but we also begin to see domestic terrorism. And some of this is coming out of a movement in the US that, that we've seen seeds of going back to the late 60s and 70s, but really came to fruition in the 90s and something we still see today. And that's the rise of sort of anti-government, anti-federal government, anti sort of distrust of anything to do with the federal government. Um, and this point, it tended to be kind of from the right in the early 2000s under George Bush, we'll see the left kind of pursuing this. Lately, it's been from the right again, but it's not limited to any one po particular political party or political persuasion. But again, with Watergate, the Iran-Contra affair, the Pentagon Papers, the, uh, the investigations of the CIA and the, and, and the FBI in the 70s, the rise of conspiracy theories, and the internet just feeds into this even more. There was a big a, a belief by the 90s that the government maybe were behind the assassinations of Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Maybe the government is even faking terrorist attacks. Um, maybe they're guilty of actual murder. And we even see militias rise up, uh, militant groups of Americans who are ready for the fight, ready to take on the government. Um, and there's going to be some events that are going to feed into this. The guy you see here is a guy named Vince Foster. He was a good friend of the Clintons from Arkansas. He suffered from manic depression. He worked for them in the White House. Uh, he became overwhelmed emotionally, and he very sadly committed suicide. And almost immediately, there were rumors that the Clintons had him killed. I mean, this goes way beyond the rumors about Nixon or rumors about Reagan. I mean, this was really getting into conspiratorial thinking, but this was starting to become fairly mainstream thinking. Um, there were all kinds of rumors that maybe Hillary had him killed, um, rumors that, that I've heard even not that long ago. There was an advancement. Uh, we do see the first female U.S. Attorney General, Janet Reno from South Florida. She had been a major lawyer in, in Florida, and now she becomes a uh, the top legal person in the nation. But she also was behind an event that fed into the anti-government ideas, and that is the Koreshians, the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. There's still a lot of debate over this today. Um, there's some really good documentaries and books about this. Uh, the Branch Davidians, led by Dave Koresh, he was named for an earlier group in Florida named the Koreshians. But essentially, this was kind of a doomsday group. They were a bit of a survivalist group. They lived in a compound in Waco, Texas. They had lots of weapons, lots of, you know, various guns. Getting They, they always talked that one day the government's going to come get us. We're, we're preparing for the end of the world. Uh, there's been rumors that kids may be being abused there. So uh, there were some investigations of the compound. They were re repelled. And so the FBI gets involved. Um, essentially becomes a, um, a siege situation. In other words, the government is feeding right into their biggest fears. So to them, they're thinking, this is it. This is what we've been preparing for. There is a standoff. Uh, at one point, the federal government decided, the FBI decided, we're going to take these battering rams. We're going to knock a hole in the wall. We're going to put some tear gas in. That'll get everybody out. And, and it was, you know, it was live on TV. We saw this happening. You know, and, and they put the, the tear gas in and almost immediately you start seeing flames come up and suddenly the whole place is in flames and many of the people, most of the people there uh, were dead. Now, investigations later show that some of them were shot in the back of the head. And there is also uh, some recordings that the FBI had planted that does reveal that at least some of the fires were actually started from within. So this may have been more of a suicide situation. It's still a bit of a controversy today. It's definitely the case that the FBI overreacted and, and knowing the mindset of the people, the last thing they should have done was take tanks and knock holes in the wall and put tear gas in. Um, there was a lot of media pressure to resolve the situation. Um, whether or not who did all the killing, I mean, I, I'm, I, I think the evidence does point towards the Branch Davidians as a suicide mission, but there is still some legitimate debate of maybe it wasn't. Um, this seemed to tie right into these fears of anti-government. Um, for a lot of people, this was, this is the beginning of the government coming to take our guns. That, they, that Their crime was they had too many guns and the government wants to take all of our guns. 
as a reaction to this, um, a year later, there was a major bombing of a federal building in Oklahoma City, and it killed over 160 people, including kids in a nursery. That was done by Tim McVeigh and Terry Nichols, two survivalists, anti-government activists who saw Waco, Texas, as a, a as as an opening battle. This they were continuing the battle, if you will. It's not technically anti-government, but but almost to the day. A few years later, we see one of the first of the mass shootings happening at a school at Columbine School. Uh, two of the kids who were that were involved in this were very um, antisocial, uh, and they were, you know, kind of influenced to some degree by some of this talk of anti-government and such. But they also had other issues going on. Uh, this also led to the big video game scare. A lot of people thought that that video games is what trained them to do this. There's no real evidence that video games causes violence, but still. So. Um, it is interesting, April, uh, April of each year, there was a lot of fear that what's going to be the next big anti-government moment. And again, you can look at entertainment and it is, and by the way, so much of this always went back to the, the Clintons were behind all of this, right? So you see movies in the 90s that are thrillers somehow involving governments, particularly the White House. And many of these portray the presidents as being evil as being up to no good or in case the case of jfk the government itself was behind the assassinations but again it is interesting how popular entertainment were reflecting a lot of these cultural fears the last topic i wanted to talk about very quickly is the uh our third impeachment well excuse me sorry our second impeachment at this point uh, our third was donald trump recently but our third major impeachment case, Richard Nixon obviously did not actually get impeached, although we were heading in that direction when he resigned, but that's the impeachment of Clinton. Quick reminder, impeachment does not mean to be taken out of office. An impeachment means that uh, Senate, uh, Congress actually charges a sitting president with a crime. That's what it means to be impeached. You're just charged with a crime. Then you still have to be tried and then if convicted you are taken out of office that has actually never happened we've had three impeachment trials i guess technically we've had four because uh, trump was impeached twice and they have never resulted in a conviction um and i'd be curious what would happen if we actually do see an actual conviction but clinton was indeed impeached in 1998 so how did this start some of this does come out of some of those anti-government fears, but most of this comes out of political competition. Um, the, the election of Bill Clinton, partly because it was a switch from one party to another, and he was a very different kind of politician. There had always been rumors about Bill Clinton and women when he was governor. There was real dislike of Bill Clinton by many, many people on the right. I mean, real, true dislike. Uh, in the same way, we've seen real dislike from the left of, say, Donald Trump in the last, you know, six, seven years. And so um, in um, 1994, uh, the Republicans do very well in the midterm elections. They take over the House and they quickly decide to start investigating Bill Clinton. The thing they investigated him on, the, the, the purpose of this investigating committee, headed up by a lawyer named Kenneth Starr, so it becomes known as the Starr Committee, was something known as the Whitewater Development Company, Corporation, excuse me. And of course, everybody started calling this Whitewater Gate, right? So this was a land deal that Hillary and Bill Clinton were involved in in Arkansas many years earlier. There's no getting around it. It's a little bit shady. If major laws were broken to this day, it, it doesn't seem to be completely the case, but it definitely was a little bit shady, some inside knowledge. But essentially, it was just a bad land deal that no one really made any money on that fell apart. In other words, it wasn't a good thing, but it turned out to be a bit of a nothing burger in the end. But lots of money were spent on trying to prove some kind of law was broken. And a couple of years were spent on this, several million dollars were spent. So hold that thought, put that aside for the moment. In a totally different case, we see a personal lawsuit filed by Paula Jones towards Bill Clinton. Now, she was funded by many Republican activists. So this was, this was part of that Republican versus Democrat divide. And at the time, it was interpreted by many people as just being a silly, 
time wasting effort by Republicans just trying to get Bill Clinton. That's definitely how I looked at it when I was in my 20s and the 90s. Post Me Too, and just 25 years later, almost 30 years later now, it does seem a little bit different. So very quickly, Paula Jones was a state employee in Arkansas. At one point, she was called to a hotel room uh, where Governor Bill Clinton was. Uh, according to various accounts, he was in a robe uh, not and not dressed under the robe. He seems to have propositioned her sexually. She said no. He said okay. She left. And that's the end of the story. Now, in the 90s, a lot of people said, well, even if that is true, he asked her, she said, no, what's the big deal? In 2022, we all go, well, wait a minute, he was governor, so he's the ultimate boss of all state employees. There's a power differential there. He is propositioning an employee for sex. She doesn't even know whether that might mean, am I going to get fired because I didn't say yes? We now interpret that as sexual harassment correctly. Um, it is, in other words, what I'm trying to say is it actually was a legitimate case, even though at the time, many of us did not think of it as a legitimate case. You know, this seemed to be a private matter. And you may not agree with me on this, but if it truly was a private matter, if he just had an affair, which he seems to have had a few affairs in his life, that technically is not a legal matter. And it may or may not be something we care about. You know, it might affect how you think of that person's morals, but it's not a legal matter. But once you get into boss, employee, governor, state employee, now it is a legitimate public matter. So this was a court case that was slowly moving through the court system. And of course, one of the debates was, does Bill Clinton, if it goes through, will he have to testify? Again, post me too. You know, now that we, we're in an era where we've learned about people like Harvey Weinstein and some of his horrible behavior in Hollywood, um, the 90s was when a lot of these sex scandals were coming out of the Catholic Church. And in recent years, we've seen similar scandals in other churches like the Southern Baptist a commit Convention has had its own sex scandals. Um, Bill Cosby, the big hero, a TV guy from the 90, uh, 80s, very well respected. You know, we've seen some heard how he behaved very poorly towards women. Um, and, you know, you look back at, at humor in the 80s and 90s. These are actually slightly older cartoons, but there was always this kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge acceptance that bosses are going to hit on secretaries. It's just part of the climate, even though this is something that women have been fighting since the 70s, since the Mary Tyler Moore show and, and you know, a lot of the, 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 the second wave feminist movement to try to stop this kind of climate. The 90s was still a period where some of this was overlooked as not that serious. But the 90s was the decade where we first started to really openly in a big way start to deal with these issues. And so this doesn't just involve Democrats, it's also involved Republicans. So before we get back to the Clinton impeachment trial, let's back up a little bit and talk about another case that happened in the early 90s. And that's the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas case. So <clears throat> Clarence Thomas was an up and rising lawyer and judge in the federal system. He came from very, like Bill Clinton, came from very poor origins, managed to work his way up. But he was rather unique at the time. There weren't a lot of African-Americans who were actively involved in conservative politics. They, you, you, much more common to see in centrist or left-wing politics. And he was very good at what he did. So he kind of, he was kind of a unique figure and becoming fairly well known in legal circles. Uh, Thurgood Thur Good Marshall, the first African-American to serve on the Supreme Court. And at that point, still the only one. He was stepping down. George Bush had a chance to nominate a new, a new judge. And of course, there's a lot of pressure to nominate somebody of color. And Clarence Thomas seemed to be the obvious choice. He was qualified. He had the experience. He was conservative. This is a no-brainer. And so he was nominated to be on the Supreme Court. And it seemed to be something that was going to sail through, if you will. And so the early days, you know, because the way it works is a president confirm, uh, excuse me, president nominates Congress then, I mean, it's part of the constitution. They confirm the nomination. They, they are able to investigate, ask questions, and then vote on it. 
And so initially it looked like it was going to be pretty smooth sailing. There wasn't a lot. There wasn't really any reason not to nominate him. He did seem to be qualified. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, he was fine. Until a former employee of his, and at this point, a law professor, uh, Anita Hill, said, wait a minute. This is going to be somebody that's going to sit on the Supreme Court. They're going to be ruling on sexual harassment cases and other cases involving sex and gender and, and, and labor. And he sexually harassed me. And I need to say something. And there's a lot of pressure on her not to say anything. And so she testified that she was propositioned many times by Clarence Thomas. During this period at the Department of Education, my working relationship with Judge Thomas was positive. I had a good deal of responsibility and independence. I thought he respected my work and that he trusted my judgment. After approximately three months of working there, he asked me to go out socially with him. What happened next and telling the world about it are the two most difficult things, experiences of my life. It is only after a great deal of agonizing consideration and sleepless number, great number of sleepless nights that I am able to talk of these unpleasant matters to anyone but my close friends. And again, this was something that even though we've talked about this with the 70s and, you know, there was even, you know, books about this, TV shows dealt with this a little bit, even as late as the 90s, this was still something that wasn't an open topic. I mean, even the term sexual harassment coined in 1975, it, it's out there, but most people still weren't very familiar with it and what it actually meant. I mean, you didn't have sexual harassment trainings at jobs yet. This is really the moment that that term, that idea became mainstream. Um, and, you know, it's after this case that you actually do start to get going to jobs. They go, OK, we've got to do such harassment training. And I can remember doing some of these in some of my earlier jobs in the 90s and people going, all right, we got to do this. So, you know. In fact, I remember one guy saying, you know, you're not supposed to date, you know, fellow employees. You're not definitely if you're a boss. I don't really care, but I'm supposed to, you know, I mean, like literally it was that kind of climate in the 90s. But again, it started making people really kind of discuss this. And for a lot of women, they're like, yeah, um, I don't like that naked pictures of women are hanging on the walls. I don't like that people are telling openly sexual jokes in front of me or talking about the way I look. And that's a lot of what Anita Hill accused Clarence Thomas of doing, talking about pornography in front of her, asking her out more than once. But again, what's interesting is, again, in 1991, how many people, politicians and, and, and people in the media really ridiculed her at first. Like, come on, he's just asking you out. What's the big deal? Um, there was, you know, but suddenly Clarence Thomas's nomination was in jeopardy. So Arlen Specter, Republican from Pennsylvania, was sort of basically, he was the guy in charge of bringing Anita Hill down. And this is some of, of the questioning. He did. Uh, you, you will see some, uh, when you take a look at the transcript and what will develop this afternoon, a very flat out demolition of her credibility. Professor Hill, you said that you took it to mean that Judge Thomas wanted to have sex with you, but in fact, he never did ask you to have sex, correct? No, he did not ask me to have sex. He did continually pressure me to go out with him, continually, and he would not accept my explanation as one as being, uh, being valid. You are not now drawing a conclusion that Judge Thomas sexually harassed you. Yes, I am drawing that conclusion. That well, is then my... I don't understand. Pardon me? That I don't understand. And on page three, it was my opinion at the time, and is now my opinion, that Ms. Hill's fantasies about sexual interest in her were an indication of the fact that she was having a problem being rejected by men she was attracted to. The fact is, flatly, he never asked you to look at pornographic movies with him. With him? No, he did not. I don't want to, I'd rather not. No, to determine whether or not. 
I'm going to stop there. I did kind of want you to say that's uh, Joe Biden. He was actually technically in charge of the committee at this point. Uh, it is ironic, Teddy Kennedy, if you know anything about Teddy Kennedy's history and women, he was quite the sexual harasser himself, by the way. Um, I don't expect at one point said, I don't understand. And I think he really meant that part. <laughs> I think he really, I think a lot of these men didn't really get like, oh, we're, we're not allowed to ask women out that work for us. And we can't talk about porn. Because like Clarence Thomas did was actually talk openly about pornography. Hey, I watched this dirty movie last night. Hey, you want to go out? You know, and that's what she's like. That's sexual harassment. You know, you can't keep asking me out and then talking about dirty stuff. And, you know, um, and actually by the end of this, Arlen Specter kind of realizes she's kind of right. <laughs> you know, he does actually at the end say, uh, you've really educated me. Uh, she, you know, and she held her own. Um, and again, Clarence Thomas does ultimately get nominated, of course, and is, does still serve on the Supreme Court. But this case, I keep saying it's not a trial, but, but this confirmation hearings did indeed get sexual harassment out in the public realm. And it really completely changed how we talk about sexual harassment. And the Bill Clinton case will continue that conversation. But I do want you to hear Clarence Thomas's rebuttal. Um, and again, this is an interesting thing. We talk about intersections, and I know sometimes people are always like hearing about intersectionality, and, and there's some debates about that. But it does happen in history sometimes where different things come together. So we have, you know, we're talking about sexual harassment and gender, but then Clarence Thomas is going, I think this is about race, and these two things will intersect. Anything you'd like to say? Senator, I would like to start by saying unequivocally, uncategorically, that I deny each and every single allegation against me today that suggested in any way that I had conversations of a sexual nature or about pornographic material with Anita Hill, that I ever attempted to date her, that I ever had any personal sexual interest in her, or that I in any way ever harassed her and so he does actually flat deny the charges and then he describes what's going on as a high-tech lynching and of course if you've taken us2 or learned about the jim crow movement that that is very uh strong language versus somebody coming from georgia who was familiar with lynchings and did not occur when it came time for him to publicly respond to the allegations, Thomas turned the tables on his interrogators and, for all intents and purposes, ended the debate. This is a circus. It's a national disgrace. It is a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks who in any way deign to think for themselves. And it is a message that unless you kowtow to an old order, you will be lynched, destroyed, caricatured, by a committee of the U.S. U.S. Senate, rather than hung from a tree. I mean, it, it's, that's strong language, and it did. It, I mean, it worked, and uh, and maybe he really felt that way too. Um, so again, in the end, Clarence Thomas does get confirmed, but that conversation about sexual harassment doesn't go away. And then again, it was, if you will, a teaching moment, and and a real kind of cultural key point when it comes to sexual harassment. And so again, he was nominated. He is he's still on the bench to this day. Uh, they're big players in DC. Uh, I won't get into some of the more recent stuff, but you may know Clarence Thomas's wife has is very been very involved in the debates over the 2020 elections. But that's another story. That's for another class. Get back to Clinton because because I think we need to know that Anita Hill story to kind of get the Bill Clinton story because Republicans did rightly point out like, hey, you guys criticized Clarence Thomas. Didn't Bill Clinton kind of do the same thing? You know, so you have the Whitewater investigation that went on for years by Kenneth Starr. Then you have the Paula Jones case. It does actually become a, an official case, Jones versus Clinton. Um, and as part of this lawsuit to, to establish a pattern, this is when we began to learn about po other possible uh, affairs that Bill Clinton had had, including a long-term one with Jennifer Flowers. This first came up during the 1992 election campaign. In fact, the Clintons went on 60 Minutes to denounce Jennifer Flowers, although she had plenty of phone recordings of her and Bill Clinton talking about meeting, talking about, you know, rendezvous together. 
In other words, most people do believe there was an affair between Jennifer Flowers and Bill Clinton. She was not an employee. So legally, that doesn't have any bearing other than to establish a pattern that Bill Clinton does have extra marital affairs. Uh, other people were coming up during this. But again, a lot of people were, were ridiculing the whole idea. This is just Republicans going after Bill Clinton. These are a bunch of prudes. Um, Paula Jones herself, I mean, to be honest, she was, uh, I don't mean to sound mean at all, but she was very country. She, you know, she she did not come off well on camera. She seemed, uh, people thought she wasn't very smart. Uh, and so it just seemed almost like a character in a movie. And people thought she was just a pawn, uh, a political. And there is a little bit of truth to that. Again, there are a lot of big wigs that were, that knew this case could turn into a, 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 a way to bring down Bill Clinton. But if you really get down to the merits of the case, she did have a real case. And, and again, in the same way, Anita Hill had a real case. Then we get to an intern named Monica Lewinsky. Um, very young. She Again, she interned at the White House. Uh, there was a shutdown of the government in 1995. Um, the, the, there was a budget debate. A new budget was not passed, so the government shut down. And during that shutdown, all the employees at the White House had to go home because they weren't getting paid. So suddenly the interns were kind of running the White House. And apparently that night, one of those nights, Bill Clinton, and I won't say apparently because we now know it did happen, he began a, a sexual affair with a young intern named Monica Lewinsky. This is Monica Lewinsky on the right with her family posing with President Bill Clinton during her internship. Um, you and I, the reason you and I know about this is because this comes up during the Paula Jones trial. Not only do we see other affairs, we see a guy in power having an affair with somebody who works for him. Even though Monica Lewinsky at that time did not want this getting out, she didn't. She at the time did not see this as sexual harassment, and she she was in love with Bill Clinton. She was furious that she was being drugged into this case. Uh, although in later years she does admit that it's sexual harassment, and she does realize that she was very young and her judgment wasn't all there at the time. So as this starts to come out, there's a lot of photographs that can be seen of the two of them together. Um, the, the way we learned about this, and I'm trying to get too much into all the details, but Linda Tripp, who uh, had worked for the White House under George Bush, she was later let, moved from the White House to the Pentagon under the Clinton. She did not like the Clinton. She felt they were very immoral. She was in contact with people on the Republican side, and she says, I know he's sleeping around. She became friends with Monica Lewinsky at the Pentagon because Monica Lewinsky was also moved from the White House because people at the White House knew that she was having an affair with Bill Clinton. They're like, we got to get her out of here. And so they just both happened to be at the White House. And Linda Tripp befriended her and learned that she was having an affair. And suddenly Linda Tripp is like, oh, my gosh, this is a big moment. So she begins to call Monica Lewinsky and record their conversation. Tell me again about you and Bill. When did y'all meet? How, what day was that? And you can actually hear these recordings today. So Monica Lewinsky was just a young person thinking she's talking to a good friend of hers, pouring her heart out. When the trip is taking notes and recording and turning these this information over, uh, not only to the Jones Committee, but also to the Star Committee. Um, this is a very short version of all of this. So the Jones lawyers are like, she has to testify because she establishes a pattern here. So she is subpoenaed. Um, she does tell Bill Clinton that this is happening because they were talking on the phone quite a bit. He basically says, to be fair, Bill Clinton does say, do not lie. Tell the truth. And I can't talk to you again. We, we have to stop doing this. Um, she does testify uh, as little as she, as she tries to do. At the same time, this becomes public. This, this now goes from happening behind the scenes to this is now public. People hear about this. Bill Clinton very famously denied it publicly. But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody it's a lie. 
Not a single time. Never. These allegations are false, and I need to go back to work for the American people. Thank you. Now, as you'll see in just a moment, he, because he was a lawyer, he says everything I said was technically true, and I'm going to explain that in a moment. But he was, and I remember watching this, I remember, you know, I mean, it was so direct. I mean, he names her. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Monica Lewinsky. I never did this. So you thought, yeah, no, if the president did it, he or she would be like, well, you know, they would be a little sneakier way. But this seems so direct that most of us actually thought there's nothing here. Yet again, there's nothing here. Um, turned out that there was something there. So again, more and more photographic evidence that that, that they didn't, that, you know, not that she interned, but she seemed to always be around. I mean, you know, uh, there's lots, again, photographs of them talking, holding hands. Monica Lewinsky, again, I think she was 21 by this point. She, I, I don't want to say she's a kid because she's a grown woman, but she was a very young, inexperienced young woman who suddenly is on magazine covers across the country. Uh, I, I, I actually can't imagine what this must be like. Um, and again, she was she was I, I, very pretty. Um, actually, not to get too weird, but I think today um, we're much more accepting of different body types. She's very voluptuous. Uh, but at the time in the '90s, there was this body image idea that women needed to be really skinny. So not only was she shown all the time, people talking about how she dressed, what her hair looked like, but she was made fun of for being overweight when actually she wasn't overweight at all. And even if she was, who cares? I mean, we're now in an era of, you know, Kim Kardashian and voluptuous women and Lizzo. And but this was not that era. So, again, imagine being a very young woman and then the whole country is talking about your private sex life and then judging you, body shaming you. I mean, I, I actually really can't imagine what that must have been like at the time. But again, people were openly, even you know, left and right, people on talk shows were making fun of her, making jokes about her, you know. Um, and again, I basically it became Monica versus the most powerful man in the world. Uh, Hillary Clinton at the time, because Bill Clinton was so open about his denials, that she too seems to have believed that there was nothing to this particular story. And she did, she very famously said there's a vast right-wing conspiracy against my husband. She's not completely wrong about that, by the way. There was a pretty big movement to try to get rid of Clinton. It's just in this particular case, there was something there. So, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, so the Paula Jones case then gets taken up by the Kenneth Starr Committee. Here's the problem, though. The Starr Committee was legally about whitewater, and millions were spent on this. There's nothing to whitewater. So instead of disbanding it, which is what they should have done, they switch to the Jones case. This is a problem, in my opinion, because it shows that the committee is not about following the law. The committee is about getting a president. Yes, there is a legitimate case here, but that was not a legitimate case for the Star Committee to go after. This was not a case necessarily, at least at this moment, for Congress to go after. Um, so again, what I'm trying to really point out, there's problems all around here. Um, Monica Lewinsky is does finally testify and she does indeed admit to an affair because of her conversations with Linda Tripp. Uh, I'm gonna say this delicately if you're not familiar with this, during one of Bill Clinton's Monica Lewinsky sexual encounters, which usually involved oral sex, uh, there was a time when Bill <clears throat> finished and some of that wound up on a dress and Monica Lewinsky kept it. And Linda Tripp said, do not clean that dress because she's thinking that is DNA evidence that will prove a sexual affair. So the dress actually became part of the trial, became part of the evidence. There is DNA evidence of this affair. Um, a lot of the notes back and forth between Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky became part of the evidence. Phone conversations became part of the evidence. This was the new OJ trial, frankly. This became entertainment. And it does start to become much more important than just a sex affair, especially when Bill Clinton had to testify in the Jones case for the second time 
and ad had to admit that the first time he testified, he may not have told the complete truth. And so um, he then had to publicly admit to the affair. So here is, a, like I'm going to play the ad admittance first. And by the way, he looks incredibly nervous here. Good evening. This afternoon in this room, from this chair, I testified before the Office of Independent Counsel and the Grand Jury. I answered their questions truthfully, including questions about my private life, questions no American citizen would ever want to answer. Still, I must take complete responsibility for all my actions, both public and private. And that is why I'm speaking to you tonight. As you know, in a deposition in January, I was asked questions about my relationship with Monica Lewinsky. <clears throat> While my answers were legally accurate, I did not volunteer information. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. It constituted a critical lapse in judgment and a personal failure on my part for which I am solely and completely responsible. I mean, this is a shocking admission. He had just said six months earlier, I'd never had sexual relations with that woman. Now he's saying, well, I did have an inappropriate relationship with that woman. Now, and I, I did get, I, I got a little muddled here. So he did testify in a Jones trial. He did admit to everything. Although again, he says, I did technically tell the truth. So the Star Committee questioned him earlier the same day in the same space. And I'm going to play a little bit of, this is him testifying to the Star Committee about his relationship with Monica Lewinsky. And of course, by this point, they have all the recordings from Linda Tripp. They have testimony from Monica Lewinsky. They have the dress. They have a lot of data about this affair. If Monica Lewinsky says that while you were in the Oval Office area, you touched her breast, would she be lying? Let me say something about all this. All I really need for you, Mr. President, I know, is to say I, have... I, won't, I won't answer under the previous grounds or, or to answer the question. You see, because we only have four hours and your answers I know. Have well, been it's extremely it... lengthy. But go ahead and ask your questions. The question is, if Monica, if Monica Lewinsky says that while you were in the Oval Office area, you touched her breast, would she be lying? That is not my recollection. My recollection is that I did not have sexual relations with Ms. Lewinsky, and I'm staying on my former statement about that. If she my, said, my, my, my statement is that I did not have sexual relations as defined by that. If she says that you kissed her breast, would she be lying? I'm going to revert to my former statement. Okay. If Monica Lewinsky says that while you were in the Oval Office area, you touched her genitalia, would she be lying? That calls for a yes, no, or reverting to your former statement. I will revert to my statement on that. If Monica Lewinsky says that you used a cigar as a sexual aid with her in the Oval Office area, would she be lying? Yes, no, or, or won't answer. I will revert to my former statement. It is fascinating watching his face because he's clearly embarrassed, he's angry, but he also knows they know a lot about what we did. And that's, you can see like all those thoughts and, and I won't get detailed, but about the cigar, that was something that they did and he knows they know now. And so, yeah. And by the way, let me explain in case you're not familiar with this about when he keeps saying, I'm going to revert to my statement that this did not constitute sexual relations. The way he defined sexual relations was penetrative sex not not oral sex, not using your hands, but only using, I'm trying not to say it, but you know what I mean, like just straight up, straight sex. Uh, to him, in other words, oral sex was not sexual relations. Using your hands or kissing was not sexual, of course, I always say, explain that to your spouse one day, uh, that only procreative sex, there you go, procreative sex is sexual relations. Anything other than that, may be inappropriate, as he said, but was not sexual relations. It is a legal, you know, so that's how, and that's why he says, when I testified in January or told to the American public, and I said, we did not have sexual relations, I meant it. I didn't say I never kissed her. I never said we never had oral sex. I just said we didn't have sexual relations. And I told the truth. 
All right, who got through that? So the star the star committee puts out their report. Whitewater is barely mentioned in it. I think it's mentioned literally once or twice. The whole thing's about Monica Lewinsky. So on one hand, the Paula Jones case is a legitimate case about sexual harassment. It, it is it is a real case. The Monica Lewinsky affair is a legitimate part of that case. Why is the federal government involved in this? Technically, I would argue they shouldn't have been involved in this, except for one thing. Did the president of the United States lie under oath? Did he perjure himself? It's it's a little bit murky because of the way he's doing that definition, but it does appear that he did perjure himself under oath. And that is not the sex. It's the perjury that suddenly could make this a high crime or misdemeanor because, you know, in the Constitution, it's very murky how you, you know, it's not very clear what constitutes a high crime and misdemeanor. So they're saying he perjured himself. So at that point, they do impeach Clinton. The Congress does impeach him. They charge him with the crime of perjury. Now, they, there's a lot of debate of whether they should just leave it at that and walk away uh, because they kind of realized that the American public, even those that didn't like him, kind of didn't, weren't really ready for a, a Watergate style, you know, scandal over this. There was indeed a, 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 an impeachment trial, again, obstruction of, of evidence, trying to, you know, cover this up, and but mostly the perjury. Um, so in early 1999, they did hold a trial. But by that point, we were shocked. I, I say we, the American public, were indeed shocked. I can remember being furious that he had, I was like, he really did it. I can't believe he actually did it. I, you know, but over time, uh, because it did feel so political, it, it felt like, you know, just an attempt to get rid of him, although he did perjure himself. There, the public wasn't behind this, and Congress kind of real, realized that fairly quickly, and ultimately he was acquitted of the charges, and he does remain in office. And in fact, um, left office with very high approval ratings. In fact, so again, that ultimately was the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Why I think oh, I'll explain that in a moment. Just not really, sorry. Uh, I do think this matters, like the Anita Hill case, because it got us talking about sexual harassment. Um, but I think it also matters in hindsight, because it also shows how much things have changed. I do think this case would, would be seen very differently today than it was in the 1990s. Something we've seen in other scandals in this class. You know, again, this is the era of media spectacle and, and, and scandal, politics, crime as entertainment. Both Paula Jones and Jennifer Flowers both go on to pose nude in men's magazines and become low-level celebrities for a while. It, you know, again, it, it, it's, it's an odd period, the mid-80s through the early 2000s, if you will. Um, but Bill Clinton does go on to, to, to finish out his term and for quite a while was very, very popular. Since the Me Too movement, I do think there is kind of a, a, an attitudinal change towards Bill Clinton and the whole Monica Lewinsky affair. I do think we, and I know the, I taught about this years ago. I recently taught about it. And I, I had to admit, I felt very differently about this than I did in my 20s in the 1990s. Um, I still see the political you know, attacks as being kind of blatant, just an attempt to get rid of them. But I'm not going to lie. I, I interpret Clinton very differently. I'm much more disturbed by aspects of this case than I was when I was in my 20s, again, way back in the 1990s. There's no evidence that he was involved with Harvey Weinstein as far as Harvey Weinstein's crimes. But again, you do kind of, you know, the Clintons did know the Weinsteins, you know, and again, that just kind of adds to this kind of climate of elites and abuse and things of that nature. Um Anyway, so I'm going to end it there. We're not going to get into election 2000. Um, so that is the end of the Clinton years. Uh, if we had more time, I would build up to 9-11 to, to because we do see a few events in the late 90s that are leading to 9-11. Uh, but as far as this class, we're going to end it here. I know this was a little bit rambling. I think in the future, I'll probably re-record this and make it a little tighter. Uh, but for now, this will do. Thank you so much. And I will see you guys in class. Let me end my lecture now.